What I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about the, uh, Richard Dawkins' seminal work on the, uh, the selfish gene. At the end, I'm going to provide kind of a short suggestion on the ramifications of this uh, uh, preference in our behavior and our institutions. And a, uh, Dawkins kind of runs across this in, in, a, in a very linear fashion. So we're going to kind of follow on his, and he, and he talks about the fact that, you know, we had stable molecules and, and amino acids in, in the very beginning, and they basically started to form into a, uh, replicators, okay, and replicator molecules. And then these replicator molecules basically, you know, found out that there were a, a number of replication mistakes. And what happened in terms of natural selection is that the, the mistakes that proved to be better survivors replicated themselves. And the, the factors that favored the surviving replicators, you know, if you look at the example here, is uh, longevity, uh, fecundity, or, or the speed of replication, and copy fidelity, the accuracy of the replication. So those things are, are, are factors that, that, that basically provided also natural selection. Then as we went along, what we found is that, that, that all of a sudden we have cells that can surround the replicators and they're better survival machines for the replicators because they provided those protective walls. And then the DNA we found is the master replicator for life survival machines. So that, and basically though, the DNA is all about these alleles that are in competition with each other. That's the mutations inside the DNA. And it's a zero sum game. And that's why he calls it selfishness, all right? Because it, it only one can win. And a, uh, so there's an evolution, and that one basically is one that, that becomes our evolutionary preference. And, and then he talks about how the, uh, we, we are our survival machines. You know, we're, we're this vehicle that's carrying this, the advantaged DNA. So we have, and you know, we have millions of them, right? But it, the, the idea is that it also creates a preference for us. And those preferences that we have affect the way that we look at the world, the way we deal with our, all the other objects in the world. And that he calls the, the extended phenotype, all right? And, and so basically what he then talks about is that how do these alleles get to be a, uh, find their advantage? And he talks about a number of items. And one is that, you know, they want to be able to live long and they want to be able to prosper. And the way to be able to, to, to advantage that is to, be able to develop prediction speed, bottleneck replication, simulation, purposeness, and even consciousness. So those were, were, were natural selection preferences. And then what he says is that basically, though, the DNA itself is a ruthless, selfish gene, and that's our gene behavior. But then when you look at that in the extended phenotype, which is us, right, our self that basically creates a preference for selfishness in our individual behavior. But one of the nice things there, or one of the things he talks about is that, but we are not compelled to behave the way our genes prefer. So the fact that, that our genes prefer us to be selfish is not something that, that we are compelled to do. We can actually be trained or we can, we can teach people how to be unselfish. And he talks about the, in terms of teaching people to be how to be unselfish, one of our, our major, matter of fact, he, he basically addresses it as one of the major goals of our culture. Our culture is basically the tool that we use to teach ourselves how to overcome our genetic preferences. And that's one of the main goals, theoretically, of our culture. And then, and then he goes on to talk about, you know, as the, as, the, as the genetic structure got to be more and more complex and as it developed complexity, it developed certain behaviors, advantaged certain behaviors. One of those is, is rapid movements. Another one was sensory inputs and muscle control. And then this purpose, purposefulness or consciousness and then memory and learning, and the DNA again was a was a was a very uh, a big a, a, a kind of a winning strategy or a winning tool for that strategy. But then the, the idea he says then, then how though it, 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 if you have all of these genes and they're all competing, how do you end up you know where they're not, not knocking each other totally out? How do they come up with some kind of balance? And he calls that the, there's the, there's an evolutionary stable strategy, and the rules for that are it, to advantage relatedness calculated altruism, and bearing and caring. And the reason he brings up bearing and caring is because he talks about the fact that as a species, you know, we, we actually have to have a male and a female. So we have two, two different uh, uh, DNA, uh, and two different genetic structures. And so we, we need to use 
our culture. We need to use our uh, artifacts and stuff like that to become memes to help move along uh, uh, the, 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 our preferences because we can't, set, we can't do that through the genetic structure. And then what he says, and then what I'm going to do is the ramifications. I'm going to say that let's look at our political, economic, and social institutions that we have today, and which one best leverages selfishness. And I'm going to argue that really our economic institutions really does best reference the best uh, yeah, reference to preference of, of selfishness. Okay, and so it's possible that that's the reason that capitalism is a is universal. All right, because it's more in sync with our genetic uh, preference. Thank you.